Hi, um, happy Sunday. If you're watching live, happy April Fool's Day, happy Easter Sunday, um, happy day. So first of all, um, I want to thank you all, everybody who, um, who commented on my last couple of posts. We really got an amazing number of comments in the last post, which was the announcement that the movie of my book of my story, Dying to Be Me, is about to be made. And I am so excited about that. Like, truly I am. And I'm working with an amazing team of people who are so respectful of keeping the story authentic. And, and that really means a lot to me, to keep the story authentic. Because um, I don't know if you know this, but um, I'll share it now anyway. It's something from quite a few years ago. Before my story got published, uh, before the book got published by Hay House, I was actually approached by someone else prior to that uh, who wanted to help me get my book published. And she had said that she would like to, she, she feels that my story deserves to be published as a book and she wanted to get it, get my story into good shape to submit it to publishers. And as she did that, she started to change the story and she changed a lot of the elements about it, uh, including what I experienced in the other realm. And when I said to her that um, this is not my story, you've changed my story. And she said that um, she needed to do that because the way my story was, she said, it won't sell. And I said to her, I'm not sharing my story to sell books. I uh, I came back from dying to change a paradigm to help people to share what I have to share my you know I have to share it the way I experienced it whether it sells books or not anyway um my relationship with her did not work out for that very reason because she actually kept saying um what I didn't like was she kept saying but the American market won't buy this. They won't buy it because you are a Hindu person and you have to change this and change that. And I was like, whoa, okay, I am not changing my story for any particular market or for anyone's money. So um, fast forward, Wayne Dyer discovered my story. And uh, when I spoke to Hay House, I said, you know, um, I don't want to change my story for the market. And they said, no, we're not asking you to. That's why we wanted your story, because of what it is and who you are. And I said, great, I'm going with you. And then, um, so with the movie people, same sort of thing. It was really important that they kept the story authentic. And of course, I understand they have to use creative license to get it across, to elicit the right feelings in people. But yet, um, they're going to honor the story for what it is and not change it just to suit the market, so to speak. So that was really important for me, and I'm so thrilled as to how respectful they are. I just wanted to say that <clears throat> to give them a shout out. Now today, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I have a really important topic I want to talk about. Mm, because people write to me, people write on Facebook, and, uh, oh, and if you're watching this live, please tell me where you're from, who are you, say hello. I love getting comments. I am going to take questions in about 10 minutes or so, so please write in your questions. Danny, my boo, who is helping me behind the scenes, he's going to punch up questions on, I have a little screen here. I hope it all works. Technology sometimes is so unpredictable. I'm terrible with technology. So he's going to punch up questions on the screen. If it doesn't work, he's going to shout them out <laughs> at me. Um, but if we don't take your questions, please don't take it personally. Sometimes they go by so fast. Sometimes there's more questions than I can handle. I always go back and read your comments and questions later so that it gives me ideas of what to create videos on and what to talk about and what it is you guys want to know more about. So please, please don't take it personally if we don't actually address your comment because truly there are too many and Danny's just trying to pick the best ones or the ones that are most relevant for this conversation. Um, and remember, I do go back and read them all later. And I really do try and create videos for the most important questions that come up. So today's question, which you will probably already see on, um, on the title of the video is, uh, can we help our loved ones to heal from illness? Or is it something that they can only do for themselves? Now, I always say that the real, the true healing has to come from inside. It has to come from inside the person 
who is unwell, who is going through the illness. It's an inside job because they have to get these insights or they have to get this feeling of, oh my gosh, this is why I'm going through this and they have to work through things. However, however, there are things that the loved ones around them can do and say, and there are ways they can support them so that the person going through the illness gets the right insights. So on the one hand, there are things that we can do to help them and support them to get the transformation and the insights they need. Um, And also, of course, just to support them physically through their illness. But also there are things that the loved ones who who are around them should not do because it kind of sets them back. And so I want to talk about these elements today. So if you have a loved one who's going through an illness, I think this will really help you. If you know somebody who is taking care of a loved one who is going through an illness, I think this will help them. So please share this with them. If you are a caregiver, I think this will help you. If you are a healer, a nurse, even a doctor, I think this will help you. So anyway, let's get started. So the number one thing that I would ask you to do if you are taking care of a loved one is help them get excited about life again. Like truly help them get excited about life. You know, usually an illness is like um, a wake up call or an accumulation of being tired of the way life is for the person going through it. You know, they've taken on things that they don't want to. They've lost their way emotionally, spiritually. They're not on the path that they intended to come here to be on. They've kind of lost, they've started to become somebody who they're not. They're people pleasers, they're doormats. So it's all these kinds of things. And they don't know how to get excited about life again. Also, a lot of people who go through health challenges, who get repeated health challenges, like it might be somebody for whom they have a chronic illness that's gone on for years, or somebody for whom they're getting cancer for the third, fourth, fifth time. I mean, I know of people who contact me and say, I don't know what to do. I'm getting, this is like my fifth time or my sixth time, and I thought I was done with it. So here's the thing. For people for whom it's repeated or it's chronic and it's been going on for years, it's like they don't know how to be a well person. That's really what's going on. So the more that we just focus on the actual physical illness, which is what we do when somebody gets ill, the minute they get ill, we're all jumping in and saying, oh my God, you're sick. You have to take these meds. You have to go through this protocol. The whole focus is on the illness. This And if this is the only way they know how to be a victim of illness, then this is what they will continue to be. We have to help them be a well person again. And we do this by getting them excited about being a person who's well, by getting them excited about life and living life. So it's not about focusing on healing their illness But as a caregiver, as a friend, as a family member, your job is to help them focus on getting excited about life. What do they love to do? What are their hobbies? Help them to laugh. Take them to the beach. Take them on a car ride. Do fun stuff. Um, So that is really important. If you, if you are someone who has a kind of a coach personality, a healer personality, you can even go deeper and delve into like, um, what is it that's burdening them in their life? Are they the type of person that says yes when they mean no? Maybe encourage them to make a list of things that they've taken on recently that they don't want to, that they haven't wanted to, but haven't been able to say no encourage them to let go of those things one by one, let go of their burdens. So basically the number one way is help them to get excited about life, including helping them to let go of their burdens and look forward to life again. Ask them, what would you do if you had a clean bill of health? And then help them to do it. Say, what would you do to celebrate if today uh, the doctor said you have a clean bill of health? You don't want to go back to the old life and the old person that you were. Um, and help them to celebrate and live a life of health and vibrancy and joy and happiness. So that's the number one thing. 
The number two thing is what not to do. And it's do not judge them. Do not judge them if they look frail, if they look sick, if they're not improving. Do not put pressure on them. Do not make them feel pressure that they need to see other people. Because here's the thing, a lot of people that are sick, even while they're sick, are still thinking of the people around them. They still have trouble saying no, even while they're sick. They're still taking on the duties and the responsibilities of being a good parent or a good wife or a good daughter or a good friend. They're still doing all those things. So do not judge them. In fact, help them let go of those things and remind them to take care of themselves. Remind them to, look at, to follow their own joy and that they don't need to look after other people and encourage them, um, tell them they're doing great. So let me give you some examples of how we judge people. Uh, if they're not improving, uh, absolutely do not say like, oh my gosh, you still look terrible or you're still so sick. And it may sound weird the way I say it. It's like, who would say such things? Believe me, people do. And um, I went through that. So I am speaking from my own experience of having a diagnosis of terminal cancer. I am not a doctor. I am not somebody who has studied how to treat people. I am speaking from my own experience of how the way other people treated me, how it affected me. Um, I am telling you what I would want in terms of support, knowing what I know now if I had to go through it again. So this is where what I'm saying com is coming from. And I remember that um, I went through a long phase of not wanting to see anyone because I didn't know what reaction I would get. I knew I looked sick. Um, I knew not everyone agreed with the protocols I was going through, but more than anything, I needed support. And I didn't feel I was getting it from everyone, and I didn't feel safe around a lot of people. I didn't feel safe that they would say and do the right things that I needed to hear to support what I was going through. So I was very selective, and I wanted to be alone or just with my husband, Danny, or with my immediate family members who I trusted. I didn't want to see visitors. So when people would send me messages or try and call me and say they want to see me, it would put pressure on me. And so this is something I would say is that when your loved one or the person who's sick doesn't want to see people, honor that. Please honor that. Because the more you force yourself on them, the more, again, you're putting pressure on them to say yes when they mean no. They're people that are not going to fight very hard and they're going to do it and they're going to do it for you and it's actually going to put even more pressure on them and it's going to drain them even more. That's what happened to me. And I remember one day when this couple, a uh, friend, they were close friends of ours and I didn't want to see anyone because they were, uh, including them, because I knew in order to see them, they wanted to go out and have dinner and I knew I would have to dress up. And I didn't want to face the public because I really felt I looked terrible. I looked sick. I was drawn, completely drawn and sick looking. So finally one day, because they really said that, oh, you know, we need to see you. It's been too long. Finally, I gave in and I said, okay, let's go out for lunch. And I think it was a Saturday or a Sunday. And we went to a restaurant and Danny and I were there first and we were sitting there. And then when the couple showed up, the lady, the wife, when she looked at me, she said, oh my God, I didn't realize you were this sick. Now that was the last thing I needed to hear. And I don't know what made her say that. I think she, she was just overwhelmed as to how sick I look. But that made me feel so awful about myself because when I'd got dressed up and come out, I thought, okay, I don't look so bad. I'd convinced myself I didn't look so bad. But her reaction, it was just, I just couldn't take it. I went to the bathroom and I started crying. And of course, they knew something was wrong. And then she came in to the bathroom and then she apologized to me. But for me, my it was over. I couldn't eat. I told Danny that I need to excuse myself. And then he, of course, got up and he brought me home. Uh, and then I was too traumatized to actually meet other people because their reaction was so unpredictable. 
So if you know somebody is sick, even if they're deteriorating, please, please don't tell them that. Please don't put any pressure on them that they have to get well, they have to meet people, they have to do this. Please don't do that to them. The best thing you can do is just be there for them. Number three, and that's number three, your only job is to love them through it. That's it. Love them through it. Support them through it. But the biggest element is just love them. Love them unconditionally where they are right now. Just love them. And really, that is the best thing. That is the absolute best thing that you can do. And as I said, you know, make them forget that they're sick. Don't treat them like a sick person. Make them laugh. Don't judge them if they want to drink wine, if they want to eat something fun. Don't judge them for doing that because those foods are not what made them sick. What made them sick was the pressure of trying to live up to everybody else's expectations. So number three is love them through it. So if I can repeat, number one is get them excited about living. Number two is don't judge them. Number three is love them. And number four, really important, take care of yourself. Um, if you are tired, if you are drained, if you are fearful about their condition, don't go near them. Don't go near them because they can feel your energy. You need to take care of yourself. You need to be in a place and in a position where you can be strong enough to show up, make them feel joyful, um, love them. If they want to cry on your shoulder, you need to have the energy and the strength and enough charge in your own battery to take that from them. If they want to cry on their shoulder, if they want to trust you. So you need to charge your own batteries. So don't do it out of obligation. Don't do it out of fear. Even if it's your parent, even if it's your child, you need to take care of yourself. You need to spend some time every day charging your own batteries, practicing a random act of kindness for yourself, soaking in a tub, doing whatever you do, and don't feel you're selfish for doing it. I know I did. When my friend had cancer and I was well, I did not have cancer. I felt guilty doing anything for myself to the point that I got so drained that I got my own diagnosis. So don't do that. Don't do that. You don't need to be sick to take care of yourself. So take care of yourself and then be there for others. Remember, on every airline you fly in, it says to put your own mask on before you assist others. So this is something you really have to do. And number five, if your loved one does cross over, I want you to remember that they did not lose the fight. It wasn't a fight against their own body. Our bodies are not war zones. Our bodies are not something, are not battlegrounds that we have to win. So if they do cross over, they did not lose. They have gone to a beautiful place and it was their time. They crossed over not because they don't love you enough, not because they don't love life enough, but for their own reasons, whatever they may be. Because when they cross over, they love you unconditionally, absolutely unconditionally. They love you for being there. They love you even if you've had a falling out with somebody when they cross over that's all gone. They know your heart. They know what you feel about them. So they know you love them. Um, so when they cross over, you take care of yourself, take care of your own grief, do what you have to do, but don't feel bad for them. They're in a beautiful place and they are somewhere where they can actually do more because very often people cross over because they feel they can do more from the other realm than this realm. Sometimes people cross over because it is their time. When it's their time, it's their time. And people cross over, they choose different ways to cross over. Sometimes an illness like cancer has come to rescue someone from a life which is no longer the life that they intended to create. So don't feel bad for them, but do take care of yourself and take all the time you need to grieve. And just remember, when someone crosses over, they haven't lost. They haven't lost. And cancer is not an enemy. It is your body actually trying to tell you something, trying to rescue you from a situation. 
um, and your physical body is actually your physical body loves you unconditionally and is wise beyond you give it credit for so thank you for listening in i'm ready to take your questions i'm going to look towards danny to see if he's got any questions and uh hooray there's something that's been punched up on the screen but i have to wear my glasses Catherine um, Donne Nicholson, question, I was told in a meditation that my back problems, spine, are due to me being out of spiritual alignment. I can't be in spiritual alignment all the time or meditate all the time, so how do I heal this? I love that question. Did you all hear me? Uh, Catherine has been told that her back problems are due to being out of spiritual alignment. So she says she can't be in spiritual alignment all the time. She can't meditate all the time. So how do I heal this? So here's the thing I want to tell you. Being in spiritual alignment does not mean to do something, to go and meditate, to learn about spirituality. That's what I used to think. I believed that I had to be more spiritual, meditate more, read more spiritual books in order to heal the cancer, in order to be more spiritual. I learned, and it took death for me to realize this, so I can't be that smart, that being yourself and being spiritual is one and the same thing embracing spirituality and embracing your own creativity, embracing your own heart is one and the same thing. So if someone says you're out of spiritual alignment, it means you are out of alignment with your own self. It's not about meditating more or trying to be more spiritual or trying to read more spiritual books or listen to more spiritual teachers. No, 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 no. It's about asking yourself, uh, what have I taken on that's not actually mine? Um, what am I saying yes to when I mean no? Um, what are, uh, how do I unleash my own creativity and be the person I came here to be? What am I passionate about? What brings me joy? Have I forgotten how to laugh? Have I forgotten how to be happy? When you are happy, you are in spiritual alignment. When you are following your calling, you are in spiritual alignment. When you are feeling joy, when you're with people you love, when you are laughing, when you are joking, when you are feeling light, liberated, free, when you are in love with your life, that is when you are in spiritual alignment. So I hope that answers your question. Go pursue what you love, follow your heart, follow your passion, and your back will be fine. So thanks for that question. I'm sure your question helped a lot of other people. So, um, and thank you all for your comments as well, but I, I'm happy to keep going for a bit and take more questions from you. <coughs> Any more questions? Yes, he says yes, and he's looking at them. So um, when you're working with people, ah, okay, Sylvia Bellini. My father is determined to go as he does not want any further treatment. We've got him into a fabulous hospice, and it's a case of waiting. How can we support him? Greetings from London. Hi, Sylvia. Thank you for writing in from London. Um, so... The best way to support him is exactly what I said. So whether a person wants to go or doesn't want to go, the best way to support them is to support them in living life and finding their joy. And just ask your dad every day, what does he want to do? And, I, and, and respect his choices of not wanting any more treatment. Because here's the thing. When a person lets go and says, I don't want to live anymore, do you know what they're actually saying? They're saying, I don't want to fight anymore. That's what they're saying. They're saying, I'm tired of fighting. That's why they're saying, I don't want to live anymore. Because to them, living equals fighting. And it means they're tired. They're tired of either fighting in their life, like maybe they fought to get to the position they're in. They fight to earn enough of a living. Um, in their life and right now they're fighting to stay alive because they believe there's this enemy that is um, that is racing against time to kill them and to kill their bodies and the doctors are racing against that enemy to kill the enemy and in the interim this person is forced to fight against this illness and is feeling terrible and is feeling tired and is kind of done with this whole thing and ready to go. So what's really weird is that when the person 
person stops fighting and is actually ready to go, very often they end up outliving the time that they're given. So take all the pressure off, take all the pressure off fighting. And the best way you can support your dad is to support his decision that he's ready to let go and just help him to have fun. And it doesn't matter whether he's here for one day, one month, one year, just make every day count. Ask him questions like, hey dad, if you had it all to do over again, what would you do differently? Listen to what he says and help him to actually fulfill some of the things that he regrets that he didn't do. Help him create a bucket list and fulfill the things on the bucket list. I actually wish that everybody would fulfill their bucket list or would create a bucket list and start fulfilling it, not wait until they're about to die. Fulfill it while they're living life. That's what life is for. That's what it's about. It's not about, <clears throat> it's not about living or fighting it until you get a terminal illness and then fighting the illness. <clears throat> life really is about living life to the fullest and that's what embracing spirituality is. So thank you, Sylvia. And he's lucky to have a daughter like you. Um, speaking of bucket lists, by the way, um, we had a great time on the cruise and I love cruises and that was just a couple of weeks ago. It was fabulous. So one of the things on my bucket list is to go to Alaska someday and to see those ice glaciers. So, um, how many of you have Alaska on your bucket list? So I'm going to manifest that. So <clears throat> let's do an Alaskan cruise next year. Who's with me? I'd love to hear from you if you are, because um, that's definitely something on my bucket list, an Alaskan cruise. So stay tuned, because I'm going to see if I can make that happen. Um, do we have more questions? And also, by the way, next month, I will be traveling all over Europe. I'll be doing seven cities in Europe. And I always love to see people. I always love to see you guys in person and give you a hug. So if you're around, <clears throat> you know, check out. So I think I will post the link in this thread of where I'm going to be. It's going to be seven cities, including Bristol, UK, Paris, France, uh, Switzerland, Basel, Switzerland, three cities in Germany and Croatia. Love going back to all these places. Just um, love all of them. And I love seeing all of you. So we have a question from Matthew, Matthew Aronson. Hello, two of my grandparents are going through cancer treatment. I was wondering if you can give me some advice on what I can do to help them. <clears throat> exactly what I've said. I'm guessing Yes, you wrote this question about uh, 10, 15 minutes ago. So I would ask you to listen to what I've already said, love them through it, help them to have fun. Uh, if they are wanting to end their treatments, if it's too much for them, I would support them in that. Um, not telling you to do that. I am not a doctor, so I'm not in a position to say what they should or shouldn't do in terms of treatments. But I really, really feel that, um, you know, it, uh, people should be honored to follow what they believe works with them, works for them. I remember when I was going through cancer and it was still at the early stage and I wanted to try some natural modalities. Um, and I remember people calling me, phoning me, and actually said, don't be crazy, don't do that, do the chemotherapy. And this one person I remember was calling and calling me and saying, you have to do the chemotherapy, you just have to do it, don't, um, you know, don't fall for the crazy stuff. And she was, she was like really um, so determined to force me that way, that it instilled this fear in me of the route that I wanted to follow. What ended up happening was I feared both ways because I already had this fear of chemotherapy and now I had developed a fear of the alternative because of this person who kept saying it. Ironically, many, many years later, 
um, and this is sad, this is not uh, something that I take pleasure in saying to you, but, but she learned for herself when a very close family member of hers was going through cancer and the conventional treatments of chemotherapy did not help this person. She was sadly watching them deteriorate and I was there to help her through it and in fact her family member went through um, alternatives and was trying everything. But my point is that uh, chemotherapy, whether somebody chooses it or doesn't choose it, it's not an exact, medical science is not an exact science when it comes to medicine, and doctors will agree. I know there are many doctors that have written to me, many doctors that have um, read my book, many doctors who I know personally today because of sharing my story, and they would actually agree it's not an exact science, and people are starting to have to get deeper into the psyche of the person who's sick and understand what is it that they want? What is it that they've taken on? The burdens they've taken on that they're ready to let go of. And sometimes one of the burdens even is in trying to stay healthy. So thank you so much for that question, Matthew. Um, your grandparents are lucky to have you as a grandson and to have you caring for them. And uh, do we have any more questions? Or Yes, great. I see a nod from Danny. Um, so let's go on to the next question. <clears throat> Sally Francis. Oops, the screen has gone blank. So, ah, it's back. Sally Francis. I was told to hurry up and die by, wow, by my elder brother when I was in hospital. I think some people just can't cope with illness and are afraid it makes them have to face their own vulnerability. Wow, that is um, amazing, and I'm glad that you didn't die, and I'm hoping, Sally, that you are not going to die anytime soon. It's time for you to find your passion, live your life, and I will say that, you know, if, you, if a, any of you out there um, are with people who do not want you to live, who cannot cope with your illness, please free them from your life. Please free them from your life. If you are going through an illness, surround yourself with people who will support you. Please surround yourself with people who, who will support you. Very often the people who don't support you, um, in most cases, I'm not sure about your brother, Sally, because he told you to hurry up and die and that's terrible. But in most cases, uh, people who don't support you are not doing it out of... Um, any malice. They're not doing it because they want you to die. It's because they they themselves are ignorant. They themselves feel guilty. They themselves are drained. Just like my friend who told me that I have to go for chemotherapy and she kept saying it and calling me and, and telling me that I was crazy to try the alternative routes and telling me that I was crazy and they're not going to work. Um, she did it out of an ignorance and it really instilled, it, it exacerbated my fear tremendously of what was happening because she really made me feel that it was huge and the cancer and nothing can heal it except to, uh, to come at it at like a battleground with this artillery. And so um, that was out of ignorance, not out of malice. She actually thought she was doing it from a place of love. So so this is why um, release the people in your life who are not supporting you through your illness and um, don't be afraid to instruct people how you want to be supported or share this video with them. If you're going to support someone who is ill, be on their side. Give them what they need. Um, help them to take the burdens off their shoulder. Help them live, laugh, enjoy life. Doesn't matter how long they're going to be here for or not. If you can't do that, you shouldn't be around them. You shouldn't be caring for them and move on and take care of yourself and do your own thing and heal your own self. And uh, shall we go with one more? Um, let's go with the last one. And that question is from, um, and of course, as, as I'm doing this, please keep writing your questions because they actually really help me even when I look back at them. 
Um, so Carol, Carol Miller. Hi, Carol. I know who you are. Um, Carol is from the Celebrate Your Life events, and I'm going to be seeing you in June at the Celebrate Your Life event in Chicago. So thank you for the love, love them through it reminder. I'm on a journey with my mom and continue to focus on what she can do rather than what she can't. But there are days that it's difficult when she feels she is low, when she's losing her independence. The strongest woman I know, I will remember to stay focused on loving her um, and loving her up regardless of what is showing up that day. Oh, thank you, Carol. That is, um, thank you for that beautiful note. And yes, and that's all your mom needs. And oh my gosh. And if, if any of you that have known and met Carol, she is just the sweetest soul. I, I adore you, Carol. And that really is all you can do for your mom. And again, your mom is so blessed to have you. And actually, to be honest, that's all we can do for anybody, really, anybody. That's all we can do, not just for sick people, for anybody, for our children. We're here just to love. And most people don't get that. Most people think that we're here to fight and we're here to judge, um, but we're here, to, we're here just to love. And it starts with loving ourselves. And when we love ourselves, we're able to charge our own batteries and keep recharging our batteries so that we have enough love to give other people. And when you feel you can't love, just remove yourself from the situation. No need for judgment, no need for anything. Just keep loving, keep loving yourself. And the more you can love yourself, the more you'll be able to love others. That's really all there is to it. Um, thank you for sharing your love with me on this day. If, it's, if you're watching it live, it's Sunday. Um, and if you're in Europe, it's Sunday evening. And if you're in the US, it's Sunday, well, early afternoon, late morning, early afternoon, or af mid-afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Thank you again for sharing yourself with me. I love, I love hearing from you. I love seeing you. I love seeing you in person. Um, you know, so, so please join me at my events and when, whenever I'm traveling. And until next time, love you all. Take care. Enjoy the rest of the weekend and see you soon. Bye.